somebody can come out of the crowd and run with you. You ever thought about that? What if your grandparents, who always encouraged you and nobody else did, what if they had gone on before you and they're watching you? Have you ever wondered that? Yes. What about other people in the faith? The reality is this verse tells us they are watching us. And it may sound a little creepy, but it reminds us of that old song. Sometimes it feels like somebody's watching me. Remember that? The reality is they are. They are. Those people who have gone on before us are cheering you on. The people are watching saying, oh, I hope they get this right. Look at that opportunity in front of them. What would they say if they saw your last week? Would they be excited for you? Would they be a little discouraged about what you've done? What if you could get some information? And so this whole series is about what if our heroes can get out of the crowd, run with us, and give us advice. Now what's neat about this is that when you look at the Bible... The Bible picks heroes that really would be rejects in churches today. See, the world sees a problem, but God always sees potential. And so he looked at people who really were knuckleheads and probably wouldn't even be able to pick up trash in the church, and God said, I like that guy. Let's use him. So he, we, we talked about Gideon and how God turned him from a wimp into a warrior. Why? So only God can get the credit. I mean, God found him in a wine press and took him to the winter circle. We talk about Jonah with such a bad attitude, he still preached and turned the whole city upside down. Had the bad attitude about a good thing, and again, God got the glory. We talk about Jacob, and how his whole life he was nothing but a manipulator, trying to do it his own way, and God still reached down, grabbed him, changed his life, and he never walked the same way again, but God still used him. So I wonder, what if, what if one of the most colorful men in the Bible could come down and walk with us? What if Elisha could come out of the stands and take a lap with us? We find Elisha's story uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19. And before we get into this, I want to kind of clarify, Elisha is the perfect person to talk about what it means to go through the process of God. I like to say, if you want to be God's person then you've got to go through his process. Because God found a way to take him from the background to the forefront when he didn't even recognize it at the time. Some of our lives feel like we're not going anywhere. We're stuck in a routine. And if that's you, Elisha is going to give you some hope today. But to do this, we have to talk about his calling, and then we have to talk about the transition that he had to be ready for. So in 1 Kings chapter 19, we're going to look at verse 19 to 21. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I'll go with you. But Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh, and he passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Here is the story. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is quite an interesting prophet of God. Now, if you don't know what a prophet is, let me just say it like this. A prophet in the Bible is God's mouthpiece to the people. God talks to the person, that person declares what God says to everybody else. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, Elijah is a bad dude. I mean, this guy is no lightweight when it comes to the things of God. At one point, he splits a river. Then he gets mad and calls fire down from heaven. He gets mad at some false prophets and false priests, and he just slaughters all of them. Then he gets angry and says, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. Not God. Not anybody telling him, I don't like you, it ain't raining. And God honored it. Until he said, okay, it can rain again. And then it rained. This guy is a powerful person. When he's hungry, birds feed him. Then an angel shows up to feed him. So there came a point in his life when God says, you're done. 
you're going to anoint your successor, pick the person who's going to replace you. And that's where Elisha comes into the story. So a guy who can call fire down from heaven shows up while Elisha is plowing a field behind 12 oxen. Can you imagine the scenery day in and day out behind 12 rows of oxen? And you thought your job stunk. <laughs> and the man of God walks over and throws his mantle on him, changing his life. Friends, let me tell you something. You may feel as though your job doesn't mean anything, that you have no significance, wondering if anybody's ever paying attention in your life. You're wondering if anybody ever notices you, wondering if what you're doing really matters. And some of us are trying to figure out whether our days are ever going to line up with our dreams. But let's take encouragement from Elisha that you need to give your best wherever God puts you. Because if you want to be God's person, you got to go through his process. So if Elisha were to come out of the stands and take one lap with you and talk about his life, I think he would want us to know one thing. Wherever you are, give your best in the small things. When Elisha was found, he did not have a glamorous title. Literally stepping in oxen duty. Every day, same view, every day, nothing changes, nothing moving forward. He's moving, he's plowing, nobody notices what he's doing. But the question in life is this, can you handle the little things, or do you think you're too big for them? Don't despise the small things in your life, because God is watching you work what you've got before he gives you what he's prepared for you. The Bible tells us in Luke 16.10 that if you're faithful in little things, then you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. People often skip the small stuff because we think it's beneath us. But God will put a great call on people and then give them a minimal task. And it's not that God is trying to develop your gift. He's trying to develop your faithfulness. God will put greatness in you and give you something small to develop your character. Your gift and your calling is not above your current assignment. Because if you can't be faithful in that little thing, why would he trust you with more? When I started ministry, I did not start ministry on top of anything. I was an intern in Bible college. Now some of you know I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up with my dad going to church and making sure on Saturdays that the, the teachers had clean chalkboards. Because teachers should have clean chalkboards when they're teaching children. I grew up making sure the chairs were in place with them. I, you didn't overlook any of those little details. We didn't broadcast it. There was no social media to say, oh, I'm being good today. I'm going to take a picture of me cleaning a chalkboard. We just did those little things. I didn't need help learning how to serve. I didn't. We, we grew up serving. I grew up sleeping on the pews sometimes. But when I got to uh, become a junior high intern at a church at the beach, yes, I had to start rebuilding a youth program, but my primary job was to scrub the toilets. I could have complained about it. I could have said, oh, I'm too big for this. Don't you know that I'm at the top of my class in Bible college? Cool. Here's the scrubber. And my toilets were the cleanest toilets in the entire church. You know why? Because if that's what the Lord gave me to do, I wasn't too good for it. So I started scrubbing toilets, and I built that youth group, and I built it and built it. When my junior hires graduated into high school, that youth pastor in high school started bragging about how he had grown his youth group. He didn't grow anything. He took my kids. And the next four years, he didn't build anything, but kept talking about how great he was. And then he got to stay at the beach, and I went to the inner city. Let me, but do you think I got upset about it? Yeah, I got upset. <laughs> I did the, I'm not that spiritual. <laughs> but I had to put myself in check because if I want to be God's person, I got to go through this process. And eventually in my life, I realized if I put my hand to the little things, God will give me bigger things. The, the size of the task is irrelevant. The question is, does it need to get done? 
Galatians 6.3 says, if you think you're too important to help somebody in need, you're only fooling yourself, and you're really a nobody. When Jesus came to this earth, he came to serve. There was nothing that was beneath him because he came to serve. It wasn't in spite of his greatness. It was because of his greatness. Friends, what you choose to do reveals the size of your heart. And if you're unwilling to do a small thing, it shows your heart is too small. There are some things that we just need to do because we need to do it because the kingdom of God needs it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Great opportunities disguise themselves in small tasks. Don't look for great tasks. Look just to be faithful and fill a need. And that's exactly what Elisha did. And not only did he do the small things, he knew how to do it when nobody was paying attention. So that brings us to the next thing I think that Elisha would want us to know. Give your best even when nobody is watching. Amen. That's hard for this generation. This is a selfie generation where we can't even go to dinner without posting what we're eating. Seriously, when was the last time you got off Facebook and you got into his book? I'm just curious. I've got a friend, it's so bad. We have a friend, we have a friend of ours whose husband travels for work. And so she'll post online going, husband's gone traveling for three days. At dinner with the kids, they were going to a movie. Can't wait for him to get home. And we're thinking, you're announcing on social media that you are alone at the house. Not only that, go ahead and rob me because the movie's not over until 10.30. But we're so sick with our selfies that we can't figure out how to get out of our own way. Friends, if all you do is live for likes, then you'll find yourself out of the place of God. Elisha knew how to be faithful in the little things when nobody was looking. He wasn't looking for attention when the prophet found him. Don't live your life saying, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. We want credit right now for doing things we're supposed to do. And so far, I think we need to go back. Stop celebrating mediocrity. Come on. Man, you're supposed to take care of your women. You don't get a cookie for it. Your women should feel they are the most important woman on the planet. All the ladies say, I'm a good dad. You're supposed to be. I ain't never been in jail. You're not supposed to go to jail. But we're so worried about, look at me, look at me, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. And we bring it into the church. We bring it into the church. Oh, I should stop that. Uh-oh. Give your best when nobody's watching. There was a time in my life when, uh, when I got into ministry, I had to take a step out of full-time ministry, and I found myself on the docks. And this is what was funny, because... I had been in, in some real large churches, real large youth ministries, and I found myself now in a position where they did not care who I was. They would, their special assignment was to see if they can get under my skin as fast as possible. And there are people here who can attest to this. And I remember thinking, God, why in the world did you do this to me? Are you mad at me? Why in the world did you put me in this situation? Don't you know that I'm supposed to preach? Don't you know, God, that I'm going to change the world? Why am I here on the docks? I don't even like these people. And they don't like you, God, so let's just smite them. I mean, I was getting really bad attitude. I remember sitting at the end of the pier one night, working nights, going, God, whatever I did, I'm sorry. Just give me another chance. Just tell me what I did wrong. I'll say sorry. I'll repent completely, but help me. And God said, I want you to go pray for Freddie. I said, I don't like Freddie. I don't want to pray for Freddie. I need to be used by you, God. Pray for Freddy. I don't like Freddy. Freddy's mean. So I didn't pray for him. And he got in a car accident that night on the dock, shattering his left arm. And God said, I thought you wanted to be used. See, I had to learn my lesson to do things when nobody was watching. Because if all you do is want the credit for something... God won't use you. Friends, somebody's always watching you. Somebody's always watching you. They were watching. We had a friend that the Pastor Shannon was training who was watching me and my behavior on the docks. 
got me a job out of the docks and working with another large company. Somebody saw me there, watched what I was doing, I didn't even know. Pulled me back into California. Somebody was watching me there, watching me maintain, and I got myself back into ministry. People were watching me in ministry that I didn't even know, but I was faithful. I was serving. I didn't want any credit. I said, let me scrub your shoes. I'll get your water. I will drive for you. I don't want a title. Let me just serve you, and I don't even want to be on the platform. I just want you to teach me what you know. And people say, I see you. You're doing. Why don't you come over here? Friends, if you do it for God, you don't need to do it for people. Elisha had no idea that day when he was stepping in oxen doo-doo that the next step was going to bring him into his destiny. Friends, some of you here today, this week, you're going to go to work and not realize you've just stepped into your destiny. There is something that's about to shift, and I believe it. What we're trying to do here is God is trying to make sure, though, that your character lines up with your calling. God's not punishing you. He's positioning you. So when you think that I don't know what's going on anymore, God, I can't believe what's happening. Why are they getting promoted? Why is this person forgetting about me? God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. The Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. So when you start stepping, God is going to be bringing your deliverer. And you won't even have to go track it down. I love this stuff. Thank you, man. Thank you. Amazing things happen in the right place at the right time. I call them divine appointments. Brett Favre just inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Most people don't realize his story. Went to a smaller school. Before his senior year, he had a large piece of his intestines removed because he got in a car accident. In the Shrine game his senior year, before the draft, he was, uh, got injured, had a hip injury, the same one that took out Bo Jackson. People didn't want to draft him. One team took a chance on him, and he sat there holding a clipboard until one day at the end of the season, a general manager who had got hired by another team watched him in warm-ups and said, I'm going to trade for him. And then he went to the Green Bay Packers and wrote all the record books. Because somebody saw him in warm-ups that he didn't even know was watching. After Charlie Theron got discovered in a bank, Johnny Depp's first role was landed because he drove his friend to an audition. Natalie Portman, most of you know her as Darth Vader's mom. A wife. She was discovered eating pizza. Bill Cosby took the stage because somebody... Did not show up. Jennifer Lawrence. Family trip to New York. A talent scout saw her on the street, took a picture, and now you see her in all the X-Men movies. Friends, when it's your time, it's your time. You don't have to manipulate the situation, and I hope that encourages somebody today. Somebody's always watching. So that means that when you do the menial jobs, when nobody's watching, that we are to give our best in the natural, and God will do the supernatural. Jesus. See, when you do what you're supposed to do, with the right heart and the right attitude, and you don't care who gets the credit, God will step in with the supernatural. I didn't read what later happens. You see, Elisha didn't just go to become the great prophet that he was. What happened was he left the oxen and then went to serve Elijah as a gopher. The Bible says he poured water on the hands of the prophet. In other words, I want a venti dark coffee with two raw sugars and a little half and half. Go get it for me. Go make me a sandwich. Give me the remote. He was a grunt. He did not get the attention. He spent years in the shadow watching, training, and developing. God was developing his character. And here's how we know that. The Bible tells us that when Elijah is going away, he says, what do you want? And Elisha says, if I'm going to be your successor, I need a double portion of what you have. Wow. I need twice as much as what you have. That God thing that's on you, I need double that for the ministry that he's going to have me do. It's going to be twice as hard. But he didn't get it. 
until the moment came when the chariot took Elijah. And Elisha doesn't say, where's my portion? Where's my peace? He cares more about the man than he did the miracles. And when God saw his heart, the anointing fell. Some of you haven't got your miracles because you care more about the thing than you do the person. See, when you serve God, you can't do it for what you get out of it. You've got to do it to serve His kingdom, to serve Him, to serve the person in authority over you. But if you take care of the physical, God will take care of the spiritual. John 14, 12 to 14 says, I'll tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done. Now, this is Jesus talking. And even greater works. Because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yeah, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. What do you need today? Not what do you want. What do you need? Some of you need some answers this morning. Some of you need God to intervene in your marriage. Some of your kids are crazy and you need God to touch them right now. Whatever you need, God is ready to give you your answer. You just have to ask. That's what Elisha did. This is what I want. This is what I need. Because I feel something inside and I need to make sure it's light up with you. And when that happens, God gives it. Be specific. Ask in faith and believe you've already seen it. God takes care of his part. Now, as we're making our final lap with the prophet, and he's, we've talked about the little things, we've talked about doing it in private, we've talked about how God would do the supernatural in your life, I think he would offer you three words of encouragement. The first thing is this. Don't just sit there. Do something. Don't just sit there. Do something. James tells us faith by itself unaccompanied by actions, is dead. Just like the body without a spirit is dead, faith without action is dead. People of the presence of God don't sit still very long because God is always leading them. They don't become complacent, stagnant, or stale. And they don't stand still, do nothing, or go backwards. Here's the problem with a lot of people. They're just waiting for their ship to come in. And in church, we spiritualize it and say, I'm just waiting on the Lord. And we sing those songs. I waited for the Lord on high. The Bible says, look, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew the strength of a mount of our wings like yeah. eagles. They will run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Yeah. So what's happening? They're getting stronger. They're flying. They're running. They're walking. But they're not sitting there. And a lot of people, let me just give you a word of encouragement. You can sit there waiting for your ship to come in until your pier runs out. But God does not do something out of nothing. God takes you from a follower to a leader. He takes you from a place of submission to a place of authority. He takes you from small things to greater things. But if he doesn't have a place to launch you from, he can't do anything in your life. A lot of people think they're just going to trip or stumble into their destiny. Greatness doesn't just happen. You will not trip into your destiny. You step into your destiny. So some of you stop tripping and start stepping and start moving forward because God wants to do something in your life. Dale Carnegie said, inaction breeds doubt and fear. But action breeds confidence and courage. If you want to conquer fear, don't just sit home and think about it. Go out and get busy. The next thing I would encourage you is this. Don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. The prophet recognized that something had just happened in his life. And instead of just recognizing it, he had to respond. He didn't think about his five-year plan going, man, I'm about three years in on my five-year plan. And I got this 401k moving. If I move too soon, then it's going to mess everything up. No, I really can't. I know, I know you're a pretty cool prophet. That fire thing was really hot. But... This doesn't fit with my goals. He didn't have time to make a pro-con list. He couldn't talk to his mama or his therapist. 
He couldn't get all the details or negotiate a salary. He came and responded to the moment when the moment came. But most people fail in life because they fail to take hold of the opportunity in the lifetime of the opportunity. Friends, there are windows in your life that open and close. And when that moment comes, you better grab it. You better grab hold of it. When I saw my wife and I realized that I need to marry her before somebody else does, I didn't think about it. I didn't wait about it. Listen, I'm not just a game changer. I'm a name changer. She was going to be a Brian whether she wanted it or not. Now people are like, you're crazy. I got her. Now let me ask you a question. When was the last thing that God saw something? That was a moment. You recognize this is a God appointment. This is a divine setup. Did you walk away from it because it didn't because it looked like hard work? Did you walk away because it didn't fit your plan? Or did you grab a hold of that moment? Grab a hold of the moment when it comes, and I promise you, you can change the world. But don't miss the moment. You've got to respond and react. And this is what I love about what he does. Not only does he respond to it the right way, he removed any chance of going back. He killed the oxen. He burned. He had a barbecue. You know it's anointed and there's a barbecue involved. <laughs> Invites everybody to the barbecue. What are we eating? We're eating the oxen. Isn't that your job? Not anymore. See, he was willing to give up everything and go all in. He had no plan B. Friends, are you failing because you have a plan B? See, some of us need burn the plows kind of faith. I'm not going back. There's no chance I'm going back. I'm removing any opportunity for me to go back. See, most of the disciples did that except Peter. Peter didn't go all in. Peter was a fisherman. And he kept the family business going. Just in case this Jesus thing didn't work out. That's why when Jesus gets resurrected and he comes back, get the disciples and go get Peter. Where's Peter? He's fishing. It didn't work. question is, are you willing to go all in? There used to be these missionaries called one-way missionaries. And they did not have any opportunity to go back. Uh, it was about 100 years ago, and what they would do is they would take their tickets uh, one way to wherever they were going, they bought a coffin, packed all their supplies and goods, clothing into the coffin, and they would set sail for wherever they were going to go with the full intention of being buried in that coffin. There was one missionary by the name of A.W. Milne, and he set sail for New Hebrides in the South Pacific, knowing full well that headhunters lived there and had killed every missionary that had set foot on their soil. He didn't care that he might die, because he had already died to himself. So his coffin was packed, and he left. Milne lived amongst the people for 35 years, and he was died, and when he died, he was buried in the middle of the village on his tombstone it read, when he came there was no light. And when he left there was no darkness. Hallelujah. Some of us need to get some plow burning kind of faith. Come on. Get rid of plan B. By the way, if you're in a relationship, delete the ex's phone number. Right. <laughs> plan B, no, no. There's no just in case. Get rid of it. <laughs> well, we had good times. Yeah, it's in the past. Some people are in your past and they have no business in your future. Right? Don't leave a plan B just in case something doesn't work out. Go all in. And the last thing he would do is this. He would say, don't base your life on what's seen, but on the unseen. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, we concentrate, we fix our eyes, we focus, not on what is seen, but on what is not seen, since things that are seen are temporary. But things that are not seen are eternal. Friends, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by feelings. The Christian walk is absolutely amazing. And anybody who would say that Christianity is boring has never been introduced to real Christianity. Amen. Because when you look at the life of Jesus, it was anything but ordinary. His mission was packed with power. It was filled with hope. It was bursting at the dreams. His message is dynamic, electric, and miraculous. So it is critical that when we look at our own lives and what God has in store for us, that we don't focus on the impossible, but we focus on the impossible. 
Jesus promises you, he promises you a life that is extraordinary. That's why he said, you're going to do what I did, even greater things. And I think Jesus did some pretty cool things. He loved to hang out with kids. He was healing people. Walking on water. Turning water into wine. Hanging out with everybody else the church had rejected. Jesus lived a remarkable life. And he gives you that same chance. He says, what I did, you're going to do greater things. The question is, have you even put yourself in position to be used like that? We have not because we ask not. And we ask not because we haven't gone all in. <coughs> Can I tell you this? Jesus healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He walked on water. He calmed the storm. And by the way, he is coming back. So we need to start acting like children of God. About this time last year, Pastor Shannon's grandmother, Gigi, went home to be with the Lord. I remember going out to her retirement home in heaven, and we prayed with her. By that time, it was just a moment, matter of days before she would slip into eternity. And while we were there praying with her, a cousin was there. And this cousin informed us that she had cancer. She was scared. We were asked to pray for her. So while we thought we were going there to visit Gigi, the Lord had another thing in mind. While we were mourning the loss that was coming soon, we had another potential death happening in front of us. We didn't have time to call a prayer meeting with all the elders. <clears throat> I didn't post it on Facebook. I'm about to pray for somebody. <laughs> we got around her. We laid hands on her. We prayed for healing. And God healed her. Why? Because God's real. Why did it work? Because he said it would. Why did you do it? Because we didn't want to see her die. See, when you get to a spot where you don't care if people see you anymore, when you get to a point when there's nothing too little, God gives you big opportunity. One year ago, she's still cancer free. That's a pretty cool thing. What could you do for God? if you didn't care if you got credit? What could you do in your work? What could you do in your home? With God, all things are possible. So friends, let me tell you this. As Elisha is on his way back to the stands, give your best wherever you are. Wherever you are whether it's public or private, the background or the forefront, give your best. But it starts with giving yourself to Jesus. Now some of you, you've been going to church your whole life, but you've never actually gone all in. I'm okay. Let me ask you a question. If you went halfway in with your marriage, would it work? If you went halfway in with your job, would you keep your job very long? So why in the world do we think that Jesus would accept anything less? It's time to go all in. And I promise God will use you. The truth is this. The outcome is God's responsibility. But the obedience is ours. But in order to step towards your destiny... You have to step away from your security. Some of you need to hear this one message. You cannot be in two seasons of your life at the same time. You need to let go of one to step into the next. And it may be scary, but that's why it's called faith.
Faith doesn't demand the details. It just requires belief. If I can have everybody just close your eyes for a moment. Can I tell you? Some of you need God right now. You need God. You need God because you have a past. Things that you have been holding on that you need to let go today. Some people spend years and years and decades holding on to things that they need to let go of. Jesus can break those chains today. Why do you need God? Because you're present. Jesus is your friend. He is not mad at you. He is mad about you. And he doesn't see you the way you are. He sees you the way that you can be. He doesn't look at you and say, man, we got a problem. He says, ooh, we got some potential. He doesn't look at you and see a mess. He sees a living message. Why do you need God? Because he's the only one that holds your future. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. They're good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. Your life is not random. It's not an accident. God's not making it up with you as you go. He's got a plan for you, a purpose for you. If you just line up with what heaven is saying about you. This morning, I want to give everybody an opportunity to get right with God. Maybe you've walked away from Him. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Or maybe you're still not sure about the whole God thing, but you're really curious. It doesn't matter where you are right now. Every day I get up in the morning, I say, Lord, I just want you to know I love you and I'm yours. I give my life to you because I want them to know. My marriage would be horrible if I only told my wife once that I loved her. Maybe you just want to tell Jesus today you love him. Maybe today you want to decide to follow him completely. But if you just want to make sure you're right with God, if you want to rededicate your life to God, or you want to give your life to God for the very first time, just lift your hand up. Nobody look. Nobody look. This is not to embarrass anybody. Your hand's going up. You're not alone. Hands are going up. Here's what I want to do right now. Go ahead and put your hands down. If I can have everybody stand for me right now. I want to just lead us in a prayer of rededication. One that just kind of positions ourselves, saying, God, I, I'm giving it all to you right now. I'm going all in. And because I don't want to embarrass anybody, could you all join me in prayer so that those who are making this decision for the very first time don't feel singled out? They've already gone public and told me. Can we do that? Pray together? Repeat after me and say, Jesus, I need you. I know I've messed up. And I have a past. But I want a future with you. Please forgive me all the times I've messed up and lived my life like hell. I want to live like heaven from now on. So from today on, I'm going to live my life for you. In Jesus' name.